of America, presented by DuPont. A story of the young Virginia statesman, Thomas Jefferson. Adapted for radio from a story by the distinguished American author, Marquis James, with Carl Swenson as Thomas Jefferson. Tonight, the DuPont Company, makers of better things for better living through chemistry, presents the story of Thomas Jefferson in the hour of our nation's birth. John Beale was originally scheduled for the role of Jefferson, but because of illness, cannot be here. Carl Swenson will play the role. Mr. Beale will appear later in the series. And here is the Cavalcade of America's historical advisor, Dr. Frank Monahan, professor of history at Yale University. Less than a month after the embattled farmers at Concord Bridge fired the famous shot heard around the world, the Second Continental Congress assembled in Philadelphia. From the everyday business of one of scores of congressional committees, there finally came forth an immortal document, the Declaration of Independence. This, far more than the ring of conquered muskets, was truly the shot heard around the world. It was heard then and has been heard ever since. What Thomas Jefferson then wrote has since launched millions throughout the world on the quest of what he described as life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is a June day in the year 1776. In the suburbs of Philadelphia, two men walk up the steps of a trim brick house. They are Richard Henry Lee and young Thomas Jefferson of Virginia. They glance at a notice in the window advertising lodging. The younger man lifts the brass knocker. It looks like a nice, quiet house, Jefferson. Yes, it does, Mr. Lee. You know, it was so noisy in the city. A blacksmith shop right under my window. Mm -hmm. I couldn't do any work. Nothing out here to disturb you but the wind and the trees. Uh -huh. Yes? Oh, are you the lady of the house? Yes, I am. Well, my friend here tells me that you let rooms. Yes, sir, I do. Come in, gentlemen. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Is it lodging for both gentlemen? No, just for me, mister. Uh, Mr. Sprout. Mr. Jefferson needs a quiet place to do some writing. Oh. Are you a native of Philadelphia, Mr. Jefferson? Uh, no, mistress. I'm from Virginia. A planter, and this is my friend, Mr. Richard Lee. How do How you do, do, do sir? Uh, we're members of the Continental Congress. Oh, both of you? This young gentleman, too? Yes, indeed, mistress. A privilege. Well... I have a nice bedroom and parlor on the second floor. Would you like to see it? Yes, indeed. Oh, excuse me. Yes? Mrs. Graff? Yes, I am, Mr. Graff. I'm an agent sent by the Committee of Public Safety. I'd like to take an account of the articles of lead you own. Articles of lead? Come in, sir. Yes, Mr. The committee is helping the military collect lead for bullets. That's right, Mr. Graff. Dr. Franklin's getting busy with his defense for Philadelphia. Is it news of the British you bring? There's no definite word yet. But Philadelphia's fortifying. We have to be prepared for anything these days, Mr. Scrath. I see. Well, then, write down that clock weight, sir. I'll note it down, then. But we aren't removing clock weights until the iron weights are made to replace them. Well, it's ready when you want it. And let me see. There are my two bowls and 12 spoons and a big soup ladle in the kitchen. Thank you, ma'am. Please bring your lead to the Committee of Public Safety in the morning, Mr. Scrath. Our ruling pays you sixpence a pound. I will bring them. But I won't take pay for giving safety to us all. You have the proper spirit, mister. And I'm sure that you'll never regret it. The gentleman's right. Well, I'll be going, Mr. Scruff. Thank you. Good day. Good day, all. Good, Good day. day. Good day, sir. Thank you, sir. Now, Mr. Jefferson, excuse me. Oh, please don't excuse yourself, mister. We need all the lead we can get. This way, gentlemen. Thank you. The rooms are right at the top of these stairs. Oh, uh, uh, you go first, Miss Lee. Uh, this house is new, isn't it, mistress? Brand new. My husband's a bricklayer by trade. He built it all himself. And the big field around is our own property. Oh. Here we are. Now, this is the bedroom. Hmm. Ah, yes. And this is the parlor that goes with it. Mm-hmm. Uh, what is the rent? Ten shillings a week. That's a good chair for your writing, Jefferson. Oh, you need a table. No, no, I have my own desk. It'll come with my saddlebag. Is it good? Will it come in the door all right? <laughs> yes, when the legs are folded up, it's no bigger than a large book. Oh, I see. Well, mistress, I think I'll take the room. And now Mr. Lee and I have a little business to talk over. Uh, would you be good enough to fix us some chocolate? Indeed, I will, sir. Thank you, sir. You sit down, Mr. Lee. Thank you, Jefferson. Heard from home lately? Yes. Letter the other day. 
Having a hard time down there. Perhaps I should be there now. I'm sorry, Jefferson. But really, you're needed here in Philadelphia. Especially now. I think we have Congress in a position to take definite action. This time, Jefferson, we're in for it. You're right, sir. Every one of us. With all we have and all we hope for. On your way here from Virginia, what did you hear? Uh, what's the temper of the people in the back country? Did you get any indication of how they feel about independence? Yes, I did. Like the city cousins. Some think it's nothing but a tempest in a teapot that'll blow over. Mm -hmm. Now, here I... I brought these newspapers to show you. Uh -huh. Here, read this notice in the Virginia Gazette. Oh, this one? Yes, that's it. I intend leaving for England immediately to return in a few months. Signed, Anthony Roxborough. Now, here's another in the Pennsylvania Journal. I propose to leave the colony for a short trip abroad. Please apply for payment. Signed, Robert Donald. Blasted Tories. Exactly. Who think they're going on a short trip and come home to find a little uprising all settled. Hundreds of them, thousands perhaps, are of the same mind. Like our cousins overseas. Adam showed me a letter he received just this week. The crown is still of the same attitude. Parliament thinks it has a riot on its hands. The time is ripe to make an issue of it. I hope you agree. I certainly do, sir. But uh, how many can we be sure of? New York is wavering. Oh, I'm sure we have a majority. Let's show the fat George we mean business. A resolution for independence. And you or I should introduce it. No. Oh, you, Mr. Lee, your reputation and talent clearly indicate that you should. Very well, then. Simply this. A blunt resolution for the Congress is one thing. Now, that's where I come in. Mm -hmm. Persuading people to accept it is another. That's where you come in, Jefferson. My resolution must be supported by a document which will inform and inspire the people. Yes. Yes, I see, sir. First a blunt statement. And then another broader and inspiring document for the people. Exactly. Mm-hmm. You know, when I was a boy, my father used to say to me sometimes, Thomas, I'm doing this for your own good. <laughs> and I found out it was for my own good. I see what you mean, Jefferson. Liberty, even for those who cannot appreciate what it means. Yes, sir. Well, sir, it looks as if my work was cut out for me. Mine, too. I'll begin immediately on my resolution. The sooner we introduce it in Congress, the better. Congress is now in session. Mr. President, Chair recognizes the delegate from Virginia, Mr. Richard Henry Lee. Mr. President, gentlemen of the Continental Congress, I am instructed by the people of Virginia to introduce the following resolution. That these united colonies are, and of right ought to be, free and independent states. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker. Father, Order that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is, and of a right ought to be, totally dissolved. We've been given no authority to discuss independence here. Mr. President, we must be allowed to consult our constituents. Mr. President, in view of this uncertainty, I move we adjourn. I second that motion, President. The Continental Congress has heard the motion to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? No. Oh. The motion is carried. The discussion of Mr. Lee's resolution will be resumed later. The session is adjourned. Oh, Dr. Franklin. Dr. Franklin. Yes, Mr. Lee. I was just looking for young Jefferson. Oh, there he is. Oh, Jefferson, come over here. Oh, yes, Mr. Lee, right away. Well, good day to you, Dr. Franklin. Mr. Jefferson. We'll soon be ready for your declaration of independence supporting Mr. Lee's resolution. I'm asking you and other members of the committee to dine with me at my home next Monday. Thank you, Dr. Franklin. As your own poor Richard has said, a stitch in time saves nine. <laughs> <laughs> well, you may count on me. Monday night, then. Well, no, I can't say that I have. 
well. I... Well, gentlemen, it's getting a bit late. Yeah, perhaps, but remember, better late than never. <laughs> right, Doctor, <laughs> right. And yet, at the same time, gentlemen, Mr. Adams is right. A thing never begun is never done. But before Mr. Jefferson, as chairman, calls us to order, help yourselves to more port. You, Mr. Livingston? Oh, thank you, Doctor. Excellent wine. Excellent. You too, Mr. Sherman. Oh, thank you. Indeed, my guests must be their own host, for a host with the gout is a guest in his own house. <laughs> you must pour your own and mine, too, if you please. You're a perfect host, Dr. Franklin. Your fare, food, wine, and conversation. All charming. I second that. Well, thank you, Mr. Sherman. But I'd like to consider my dishes appetizers to Mr. Jefferson's business. Very well, gentlemen. I call the committee to order. Frankly, gentlemen, I feel that someone else would make a better chairman. Excuse me just a moment, Mr. Jefferson. I don't think it's a question as to who's chairman, gentlemen. Whoever is, it seems to me our work is useless. You've had a delightful evening, so uh, let us say good night. And we met for a task, gentlemen. Now let us do it. It must be ready when Lee's resolution is passed. Passed? Many say it'll never be passed, Mr. Adams. Uh, Mr. Sherman, you should remember the difference between ever and never is but the letter N. Well, that may be, Dr. Franklin, that my constituents in New York will not instruct me to affront England so unnecessarily. It seems to me the question is premature. We, as delegates for New York, cannot act without instruction. Dr. Franklin, Livingston and I feel this is not the time to raise the issue of independence. I suggest the committee adjourn. But just a moment, gentlemen. Congress has appointed the five of us to phrase that very issue. Now, it's evident that a majority disagree with you. Well, then I beg to be permitted to become a silent and inactive member of your committee, Mr. Jefferson. I can only be a hindrance to you. And I too, sir. Will you excuse us, Dr. Franklin? We will leave. Certainly, gentlemen. If that is your wish. Good night, Doctor. Good night. Good, Good, night. Night. Good, night. Good, night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Well, Dr. Franklin, that leaves only the three of us. You see, I shouldn't be chairman. Either you or Mr. Adams here might have held them with us. Yeah, never mind, Jefferson. Let's not cry over spilled wine. We have three bottles left, you know. No, you've got to be chairman, Jefferson. I'm in great disfavor with our conservatives on this subject of independence. You, you get along with everybody. And Jefferson, my departed guests, are exceptions to prove the rule. But Dr. Franklin, you know how poorly I speak in public. If I get up on the floor and make a speech, I'm certain it'll ruin everything. Now, don't worry about that, Mr. Jefferson. Your phrases will carry the day by themselves. I hope so, sir. Well, at any rate, Doctor, I've made some notes. Notes that reflect the temper of our people. I have them here. Twenty-two specific grievances against the king. Any one a reason for independence. Twenty-two specific reasons. Can I see them? Certainly, Dr. Franklin. There they are. And here's a preamble. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Listen to this, Adam. Mm-hmm. There are certain unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, you won't need any help from us, Jefferson. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's precisely it. Precisely. Well, the time is fleeting, Jefferson. Let's see the paper as soon as you can. Knowing the temper of Congress, I'm convinced Lee's resolution will be passed pretty soon. Good evening, Dr. Franklin. Mr. Adams. Warm again today. Yes, yes, yes. Well, gentlemen, like the witches in Macbeth. Now we three meet again. Eh? <laughs> now, it was a harder fight than even I anticipated. But, gentlemen, the Lee resolution is passed. Now, assuredly, we must all hang together. Or we shall all hang separately. Mm. Mm. Too bad Lee had to go home and couldn't be here to see his resolution adopted. Yes, it was. But now, gentlemen, a toast to our independence. And to July 2nd, the day we won it, gentlemen. The 2nd of July... A day that will go down in our history as the anniversary of our independence. And now, gentlemen, I'll be glad to hear your criticisms of my declaration. Well, oh, Jefferson, uh, Mr. Adams and I both read your draft. We haven't any serious criticism. Only a minor suggestion here and there. You see now, as I recall, near the start, you said 
when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for a people. I think I made one change there, crossing out A and making it read one people. Yes, one people. Yes, that's done, Dr. Franklin. I made that change. Good. And, uh, later on, I believe you stated, we hold these truths to be sacred and undeniable. Would you agree that we hold these truths to be self-evident? Much better. Much better. Much better. I did, sir. Mr. Adams, have you any further suggestions? Uh, I believe not, Dr. Franklin. Well, there we are, then. Let's see, as I recall, about a score of changes among us, and we're all agreed. Well, I'll go home now and make a fresh copy so it'll be ready in the morning. Do that, Jefferson, do that. For he must labor today who would be ready for tomorrow. <laughs> well, in that case, Dr. Franklin, I'll go to my lodgings and labor tonight, and we'll be ready for the Congress. Continental Congress is now in session. Mr. President? The chair recognizes the delegate from Virginia, Mr. Thomas Jefferson. Mr. President, gentlemen of the Continental Congress, when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal stations to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. Now, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states. Sixty delegates in powdered wigs are stirring uneasily in their seats. One member jots down a note. Another scowls. The third adjusts his wig. One slaps a fly away from his silken leg. The red-haired delegate from Virginia is nearing the end of his reading. They have full power, levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and do all other acts and things which independent states may have right to. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Mr. President, I strongly object to this paragraph on slavery. I think it's poor taste to condemn the king for a crime in which many of the colonies have shared. I agree, Mr. President. Mr. President. I move that the following words be stricken out of Mr. Jefferson's declaration. His Majesty has waged a cruel war. Jefferson, 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 come over by the door. But, Dr. Franklin, Franklin, I miss hearing the argument. Uh, never mind, never mind. Let them talk. Let them talk. You need a breath of air. You see, Jefferson, why I avoid drafting state papers. Well, they shouldn't take out the paragraph on slavery, Dr. Franklin. It's a question that should be clarified now. Perhaps, perhaps. But speaking of changes, let me tell you what happened to a friend of mine. He set up a shop, and over his door, a sign read, John Thompson, Hatter, makes and sells hats for ready money. Below was a picture of a hat. Well, first one, then another, offered suggestions as to how to improve the sign. Pretty soon all John had left was his name and the figure of the hat. <laughs> An apt comparison, Dr. Franklin. It seems to me that nobody's on our side but those livery stable flies biting at the member's leg. I'm not so sure, Jefferson. We'll see when the vote's taken. Well, it looks to me, Doctor, that the vote won't come for some hours yet. The 
delegation from Delaware. Delaware delegation stands for the Declaration of Independence. The delegation from Virginia. The Virginia delegation stands for the Declaration of Independence. The delegation from Pennsylvania. Dr. Franklin, have the other members of your delegation arrived yet? No, Mr. President. But I'm certain Mr. Dickinson and Morris are not coming. I therefore announce that the Pennsylvania delegation stands three to two for independence. Twelve eyes with the New York delegation in sympathy but not voting. I think we may call it unanimous. It is unanimous. Well, Dr. Franklin, it's done. Yes, yes, it's done. Now, my boy, I suggest you let up for a while. Well, sir, I believe I will. I have some shopping I could do. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, ma'am. I'm looking for a present for a lady. A young lady, sir? Yes, my wife. Now, uh, those gloves would be nice, don't you think? They're the finest we can get in Philadelphia these days. Uh, what size, sir? Oh, you know, small size. Give me about uh, six or seven pair and, uh, you know, mix the colors up. <laughs> I'm sure that you know more about it than I do. Very well, sir. Now, let me see. Two black, two lavender, two white, and a pair of red ones. Huh? Something else, sir. A bonnet? A kerchief? No, that'll be all, I think. Thank you. Then that'll be 20 shillings, sir. Tell me, would you know why they're ringing the bell over at the State House? The Congress passed a declaration for independence. Oh, I see. Well, I hope it's all for the best, sir. But thank you, sir. Your wife must think you a generous husband. I'm sure she will like the gloves. minutes now, Father, until midnight. Mm. Fifty years ago. Fifty years since the bell rang and I bought those gloves for your mother. Yes, Father. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Is it the fourth yet? Almost. I'll tell you. Try to rest a little, Father. Yes. Yes. Martha, is it the fourth yet? Yes, Father. Now. Now it is. The fourth of July. I've lived to see it. July 4th, 1826, 50 years to the day the Continental Congress in Philadelphia adopted his and our nation's Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson breathed his last. And tonight we salute the man who wrote the immortal document, embracing the principles of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, a new charter of freedom for all mankind, Thomas Jefferson who holds an honored place in the cavalcade of America. And now before we hear from Dr. Monahan about next week's program, we have a story from the wonder world of chemistry. With all his affairs of state, Thomas Jefferson was never so busy that he was not concerned with his broad acres of farmland. One day he wrote a letter. 
The date was April 26, 1811. The letter was to a young man named E.I. DuPont de Namur, who, nine years before, had founded the company that still bears his name. Jefferson wrote to young Irene DuPont as follows. I am engaged in work which require a good deal of rock to be removed with gunpowder, in doing which, with the miserable stuff we have here, we make little way. Will you be so good as to send me a quarter of a hundred of yours? Address to Messrs. Gibson and Jefferson of Richmond, who will forward it to me. Now, we don't know what blasting job Farmer Jefferson wanted the DuPont powder for, but we do know that ever since those early days, DuPont industrial explosives have played a pioneer part in helping build America. During the latter part of the last century, chemists developed a new blasting agent, dynamite, far superior to the black powder available in Jefferson's time. Dynamite made it possible for man to accomplish undreamed-of miracles, blasting tunnels through mountains and under rivers, building huge canals, dams, and water supply projects, mining coal and metal, clearing the path for progress throughout the nation. One current example of the engineering feats made possible through the use of dynamite is the new Pennsylvania Turnpike, hailed as the greatest single highway project ever attempted in American history. For more than 160 miles of the way between Harrisburg and Pittsburgh, the Pennsylvania Turnpike runs boldly across the state, much of it through rugged, mountainous country. But motorists won't have to go up and down over the Appalachian Mountains. They will roll right through them on a broad, level highway. The total hill climbing will amount to only a third as much as the hills on existing roads. And curves are slight and far between. The result will be a remarkably modern speedway. Four wide lanes with east and west traffic separated by a center parkway and no intersecting crossings of any kind. Truly the highway of tomorrow. And dynamite, created and manufactured through chemistry, makes such heroic work possible. DuPont and other chemists supplied the dynamite used in building the Pennsylvania Turnpike, which already has given jobs to as many as 18,000 workers at one time. There, indeed, stands a monument in concrete to American enterprise. And a fitting example of the DuPont pledge, better things for better living through chemistry. And now, Dr. Monaghan. Last week, we presented this question. Why do we celebrate Independence Day on the 4th of July when Congress actually voted independence on July 2nd? Many persons confuse the voting of independence with the adoption of the formal declaration of independence, which, of course, did take place on the 4th. And it is Mr. Jefferson's declaration, and not Mr. Lee's resolution, which has become the classic statement of democracy throughout the world. My question for next week is, how did the last of the great American freebooters contribute to the cer certain success of Andrew Jackson at the Battle of New Orleans. Thank you. The orchestra and musical effects, as usual, were under the direction of Don Voorhees. Next week, the Cavalcade of America will present a radio dramatization based on material suggested by Marcus James. It is the story of the glamorous freebooter, John Lafitte, who ruled an island stronghold in the Gulf of Mexico. Until next week, then, this is Thomas Chalmers saying good night and best wishes from the DuPont Company. This is the National Broadcasting Company.